I'm really happy to be here today to talk about um, my PhD project that I completed here at UCL. And the title of my talk is Expressive Language Development in Minimally Verbal Autistic Children, Exploring the Role of Speech Production. So the plan for today's talk is to give you a little background as to why I think speech production skills are relevant um, for this uh, question and then to talk about my two studies. So the first study is a longitudinal study of a minimally verbal cohort, following them for a year and looking at what um, early observable factors predicted their later language progress. And uh, some of those participants then went on to participate in study two, which was the trial of a new intervention that was um, app-based and looking at trying to boost speech skills in this group. And I'm going to talk about the feasibility and the efficacy um, analysis for, for that. And then at the end, I'll try and bring all the threads together and, and have some discussion points. And to tell you my take home messages already at the beginning, um, I think that um, this research really points to speech skills being important for minimally verbal autistic participants and that interventions targeting speech sound de development are really worthy of for, uh, warranting further study. So the background first, um, we know that there's a really huge, um, there are huge individual differences in language development in autism. And um, it's clear that communication skills are really, really important for a whole range of things associated with leading a healthy, happy life. Um, things like being able to self-advocate, being able to access verbally mediated supports and therapies are just a few of them. And we know it's a, a really um, key community priority because uh, recent um, uh, James Lynn's Alliance process um, put together autistic people and their allies and among them the stakeholders agreed on uh, research questions that were important to them and number two was language and communication interventions. And yet there's still so much we don't know about what it is that uh, causes this variation that we see and what kind of supports and um, interventions could be helpful to boost communication skills. And the people most impacted by that are the 25% or so of autistic people who remain minimally verbal. Um, and those people are the focus of my research. So before I go on, I just wanna kind of clarify what I mean by minimally verbal. There's no fixed definition, but for me, it's someone who has very limited oral language. So they may have one or two words and they may be able to use those regularly, um, but they don't have that breadth of um, self-expression and they may, or they may have words that they don't use in a communicative way. So with a partner using for a specific purpose. And this is different to those who identify as non-speaking. So for those people, they've got a rich expressive uh, language, um, but they just uh, prefer or, or need to use a different modality other than speech. So that's a kind of different thing. And minimally verbal participants have been historically left out of research. It's more difficult to incorporate them and find appropriate ways of testing their skills. But luckily this is changing gradually. Um, and one other thing I want to point out at the beginning is that my research is um, focused on spoken language as an outcome, but that doesn't mean that other forms of expressive communication are not equally valid and important to study as well. So thinking about um, what might influence language development, um, there's quite been quite a lot of studies on, on this in autism and in typical development, and some studies just focusing on minimally verbal autistic people and what predicts their language as well. Kind of general factors that we tend to see over and over again are skills like uh, attention, memory, cognitive skills, and motor skills. Um, these all contribute to um, uh, language development. We also see some more autistic um, autism specific uh, types of factors that may be important. So um, sensory processing differences could be thought to impact a language development because you may be perceiving the input differently. Um, motivation, social motivation might be different in autistic people so that might impact um, the amount of interaction that you experience. Um, and joint attention skills have been quite frequently linked with language development, um, especially in autism. So that joint attention is the ability to kind of jointly attend with another person to a, an object or an ex activity in your environment. And when you think about it, these things are kind of all important for making 
world to word mappings of um, what you see in your environment and what we're calling it um, to make to make those um, connections and boost language. But these things are all within person and people don't exist in a vacuum. They interact with their environment, especially in communicating. And so we also look at um, things that uh, so parent factors, uh, things that parents do um, to um, help children develop their, their communication skills. So we look at the quantity and the quality of the language environment that children are growing up in. And these things are all really important to study, but unfortunately, sometimes they're studied in isolation. Whereas what we know is that they're all really interrelated and some of them are highly correlated with each other. So I was, um, I was um, inspired by a study a few years ago that um, was interested in minimally verbal children and wanted to kind of uh, look at all the possible predictors and really identify those that stand out as being the um, value added predictors that retain their predictive power, even when you take into account all the other related factors. Um, so that study was by Paul Yoder and colleagues, um, and this is just a kind of diagram of what they did. Um, they had 87 um, minimally verbal autistic children at the beginning of the study and they measured uh, their expressive language at five time points across 16 months um, and they would they did this by asking parents to report the expressive language skills and then they looked at some background variables and some predictors that um, and, and see what the relationship was with language growth um, the the final result was that um, these four predictors came out as being um, the key predictors that um, were related to um, language growth. They predicted about half of the individual differences in the cohort. Um, so I'll just take these in turn. Um, communicative intent was measured to try, it was a, a measure of how frequently the child would display communicative behaviours in an interaction. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, about social motivation and um, understanding the purpose of communication. And then parent responsiveness was about how frequently the parent was talking about what the child was attending to, um, because it's quite important for making those links uh, that that happens. Response to joint attention was tested um, experimentally by trying to get the child to attend to, to specific things in the environment following cues. Um, and those three things are all, uh, they come up commonly and they're frequently incorporated into interventions in some way or other, where it, whether it's a parent training or a program to try and boost joint attention skills. So these are things that we've seen before um, as being important and being focused on for interventions. But the fourth one, consonant inventory is slightly different. It's not really related to um, social cognition as such. It's a measure of how diverse the, the vocalizations are that the children were making when they were attempting communication. So some children had a very limited uh, range of sounds that they made and others had a broader range. And this was found to be important for later expressive language. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I have an interest in speech production and I wanted to drill down a little bit further in that. So speech production in autism, um, in the past, it's been uh, sort of ignored slightly because uh, some studies that were done on um, verbal kind of older and cognitively able children suggested that if they did have a language difficulty, it definitely wasn't in the speech sounds and the actual production of the words. That was something that they didn't struggle with. Um, but I think this uh, isn't the full picture and there weren't initially much, uh, many studies on um, early phon phonological development. So the early development of speech sounds and how this um, is in minimally verbal cohorts in particular. But that's changing now and um, so a lot more research is being, is being done relating the quality of early vocalizations to later expressive language. And with lots of um, different perspectives um, on what that, why that might be, why, is the, why are the early speech sounds linked to the later language? Um, I've tried to distill this to quite a simplistic um, uh, explanation, but um, the speech attunement framework um, is really saying that, um, yes, uh, speech and later language are related, but it, it's more a side effect of, um, of the change in social cognition that happens. So um, typical children start to tune into speech and then start to make their productions based on that. And it's really kind of saying that this might just happen on a different time scale in, in autism. And so when we see um, a change in the, in the um, maybe the social motiva 
motivation or the joint attention of a, a child, they start to be aware of their, the speech in their environment and then they start to make sounds. So um, that would kind of argue that it's not really speech motor related, it's more of a, a social cognition explanation. But another interesting idea is that some children um, who have a very limited communication in autism have an additional um, motor planning deficit that, or a difficulty that um, gets in the way of their spoken language. So they may well have, um, for example, good symbolic understanding and good receptive language, but they still aren't producing uh, speech and that's due, that may be due to additional barrier. So thinking about interventions, um, the only thing I want to kind of say uh, up front is that um, there have been lots of different types of intervention using different approaches, uh, some behavioral, some alternative using music and rhythm and sound. Um, but in terms of high quality uh, interventions, um, there are very few. And so um, what we really need to do to try and get, get a better understanding of what works is to um, produce more high, high quality, well-controlled studies that um, can um, help us understand. And this is kind of a, a pyramid of, um, so at the top, you've got the, the, the best quality type of um, uh, studies that we can really uh, rely on their conclusions. And more down here towards the bottom, these ones are a, a, a bit less, um, a bit lower quality. Okay, so that's the background. And I'm going to study, talk about study one now. Um, if you're interested in this study, there is a paper out from last year with a, a bit more information in there about the models and so on that we used. Um, but this study was all about predicting uh, growth in um, expressive language in, um, in minimally verbal preschoolers. So our aims, we, we very much took the template from the previous study. Uh, we wanted to take those top four predictors that had been identified and see if they were also predictors in another cohort. So many aspects of the study were the same. It was a sh slightly shorter period, 12 months, um, but I had these same four predictors. And due to my interest in this speech production variable, I wanted to really drill down into speech production and see if there was a, a, a better way of measuring it, a more accurate way of measuring it. Um, because we know that when skills are first developing, um, they can be, uh, measurement can have more error in it and it can be more difficult to capture. And we also know that these children are sometimes um, different from day to day, depending on um, the sensory reasons, behavioral reasons, the context that they're in. So I think I thought it was really important to try and broaden out the measurement of this speech skill. So I recruited 27 children and I followed um, the inclusion exclusion criteria of the previous study. So they all had a diagnosis of autism and they all had very few spoken words. Uh, one thing I had to change was that um, I'd aimed for two to four year olds uh, like the previous study, but I had to widen it to slightly older children, so up to the age of five, um, to support recruitment. And this is what the study looked like. Um, four time points. At time one, all the predictors were measured. Um, and then during, at, at each time point, the expressive language was measured. Um, so we could see the kind of trajectory of how that changed. And I've got a bit more information about the, the variables that I measured. So these background variables, um, autism profile and nonverbal cognition, um, they didn't actually go into the model. They were just to characterize the sample and see if they were similar to previous studies uh, samples. And then the predictor variables that I measured, um, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of how each one was measured, but it did involve a lot of uh, video coding of interaction. So it was very much an observational way of measuring. Um, it's very difficult to do standardized tests or, or other experimental uh, methods with, with this group. And I added on this new uh, phonemic repertoire measure that's really um, just trying to measure the same latent um, skill of speech skills, but just in a broader way. So taking three different types of measurement instead of just the one. And I've just got a diagram here of what that means. So I, I took the observed um, variable that um, was already used for consonant inventory. So you watch a video of a child interacting and every time they make a vocalization that's communicative, you note down the sounds that they included in that vocalization. But then I had parent reported sounds. So the parents were asked to report on um, 
which sounds they thought that their child used communicatively uh, on a regular basis. And then I tried to elicit sounds um, when I met the children, so trying to just get them to repeat after me a sound, which is a different um, type of skill. And then finally, um, the dependent variable, as I've mentioned, it was expressive language reported by parents, uh, and this has been shown to be quite reliable in the past. And I pre-registered my predictions on um, the Open Science uh, Forum. So this is uh, a way of making your research more transparent and reproducible. Um, you effectively timestamp your methods and your predictions before you do the study um, to sort of hold, hold yourself to them. Um, and these were my predictions. Uh, so I thought that the, four, the same four predictors would um, show up as predicting language in this cohort as well. And I thought that my new measure of phonemic repertoire would improve on the consonant inventory measure just by, by being more accurate. Um, so these are the results. Um, the first thing to say is I was quite lucky to have a almost complete data set. So it's common to have a lot of missing variables in, in these studies, but um, I visited the families in their homes. Um, so I was able to kind of gather all the data that we needed. And I think that made um, families where they had one or two uh, children with complex needs that uh, they were able to join in in the research. Um, they wouldn't have um, been able to go to a clinic uh, to, to take part in all these experiments. Um, anyway, so uh, expressive language changed over the period. Um, you can see that the range of words spoken at the beginning was very tight and that was because of the exclusion, the inclusion criteria and then it widened out massively. Um, but what you can see on, on, hopefully on this graph is that this was driven really just by two children who made a lot of progress between time two and time three. So they're, they're expressive, the words that they spoke jumped from sort of 50 to 320. Um, so they made a big improvement, but the, if you take those out, because they're kind of outliers, um, the rest of the children only really gained about 17 words on average um, during the year. And if you bear in mind that they started the study with an average age of four years and two months, um, this is obviously very minimal progress. Um, and two thirds of them still met the criteria for being minimally verbal at the end. And a quarter of them um, had produced no words at all throughout, throughout the study. This is just to show you those two children that make the big jump in their trajectories and everyone else with a fairly flat trajectory. Um, and when I measured the predictor variables, there was a lot of variation in those. So this is definitely not a homogenous group. Some were very communicative, some, some weren't, some were good at joint attention, some weren't. Um, and the parents also um, behaved very differently in terms of how um, responsive they were to the children's attention, um, kind of attentional leads. Um, but the protocol that I had said I would follow was that if um, any of these predictors correlated with expressive language, I would include them in my model and then go through a process to find out the best model. But actually, um, the first three, um, those kind of social cognition related variables didn't correlate with um, expressive language in my sample, which was surprising. So the final model um, that um, was the best fit to the data um, ended up being a, a model where consonant inventory was the only predictor other than time as well. Um, and so these three variables were not found to, to have a relationship with um, expressive language that we expected. And this model explained 30% of the variation that we saw. And then um, when I swapped out the consonant inventory for the kind of broader measure of speech skills, um, that was an improvement in the, in the model fit and more variance was explained. So circling back to my predictions, um, the first one didn't uh, turn out to be true. So only one of the four predictors um, was, was included in the final model. And the second predictor was, it was the case that um, a broader measure of the same thing was better than um, just consonant inventory. And it's lucky that speech skills did turn out to be so important in this cohort because that was the purpose of study two was to, to investigate whether speech skills can be an intervention target. Um, and so the, the main aims of project uh, study two 
where to create uh, an intervention, design an intervention. Um, and we wanted that intervention to be um, designed in a user-led way involving stakeholders. And we wanted it to be app-based because we thought that would be scalable. And if it worked, it would be something that would be, be able to be rolled out at a low cost. Um, and then we also wanted it to be parent mediated um, because um, practicing speech sound is something that is ideally done little and often um, every day rather than in a big kind of chunk with a specialist. So parents did seem in, in the best position to be rolling that out. And so we collected, um, the, the next aim was to collect data about did this intervention app, um, work, did people like it and did they use it? Uh, which is the first kind of hurdle. Um, and then we also wanted to test out um, a different way of evaluating efficacy, a different kind of study design that would be maybe something that we could use again and again to try and measure interventions in, in this population. So um, I'm gonna talk about the design and feasibility aspects first. Um, and if you're interested in reading more, there's a paper out from last year about that too. Um, our main goal with the feasibility uh, was to, as I said, assess acceptability and use usability. But first we had to create the app. Um, so, uh, as I said, we went through an iterative process, but we had to start somewhere. And um, our initial uh, thoughts about the design were led by um, the literature and um, also the kind of um, idea that if you're trying to train speech skills, uh, you it's very difficult to prompt physically because all the work is going on inside the person's body. Um, and it's also difficult to get um, autistic children to pay attention to models. So you can try and model a sound to someone, but it really relies on them briefly paying attention to your face and your voice at the time that you're doing it. Um, so we relied on the video modeling literature to kind of put together this um, sort of longer um, modeling uh, of the sound so that um, children could watch that um, over and over if they if they wished to try and um, get more input into um, what it looks like when make, people make sounds and what the sounds are like and try and isolate that one small skill that's a tiny building block in the way to making words. And we wanted to boost the salience of the visual material even further by using um, cued articulation signs. So this is a, a system devised a while ago that um, links each um, speech sound with a hand sign. And the link, the linking is kind of intuitive when you think about how you make the sign. So the best way to explain it is, um, I'll give you an example of the, the sound B. So when you're sound, saying B, you kind of bring your lips in together and then kind of pop them out. So the, um, the cued articulation sign for B is, is kind of like B. So your lips are kind of popping out. So that would be one example. So we wanted to incorporate that. And of course we wanted to make the app fun. Um, the best way to do this kind of thing is repeated um, practicing little and often. So we wanted to build in motivation that would be linked to children's um, specific interests, which we didn't expect to be uniform. We thought that they would be like quite esoteric. So the customizability was really important. Um, and finally, because we knew we wanted to use this case series design, we needed to have a way of repeatedly measuring the speech skills throughout the um, course of the experiment. So that was built into the app as well. Um, and now I'll just take you through what the app kind of looked like when you used it in the intervention phase. Um, first of all, the child would select a sound. We, at the beginning of the study, allocated uh, nine sounds to each child, depending on their profile. Um, and then three of those were chosen to be intervention targets. So that meant that when we were testing um, repeatedly the sound skills, we were testing some trained and some untrained sounds. So they'd choose the sound and that would trigger um, a whole load of um, sound stimuli that they would listen to and see. And this was uh, very much customizable. Um, if you didn't like dogs, you could have dinosaurs or whatever it was. Um, and it married up the sound with some images that might be interesting. And then the um, video modeling uh, segment was someone, um, a very close up of someone making the sound and doing the hand sign. So that's the duh sound that's um, going on in that picture. Um, and then um, after that, um, so this would be carried out with the parent, so together, um, the parent would um, try and prompt the child to make the sound. 
Um, and at this point, the app would turn into a, a selfie mode so that um, the, it would function as a, a mirror um, and the, parent, the child would be encouraged to make the sound. And once they made the sound, um, the, the parent would then rate um, the production. So did they, if it was a duh, did they actually do a duh or did they attempt it, but it came out as something else? If the child um, did the sound or attempted the sound, um, they would get a sort of a video clip after that to kind of um, encourage them to engage with the app. Um, otherwise, they just go back to the beginning. But um, this wasn't a kind of loop that was indefinite. There was opp opportunity to choose a different sound or stop at any point. Um, and the whole idea was to make it as flexible as possible. So some children may want to do the same one over and again. Others may just want to do one and then stop and, and do some more later. So once we'd um, created the app and tried it out on um, a pilot group and got feedback and tried to Im improve it, we then did the main pilot study. And so this, were, this was on children from study one who met the minimally verbal criteria at time four. We had 19 children. Um, and as I said, each child received the intervention. There was no control group. Um, but children received a, a random, randomly allocated amount of intervention, so between six and 13 weeks. And we told families to try five minutes a day for five days a week when they were doing the intervention. As I've mentioned, the goal of this intervention uh, was just to improve the speech sound repertoire. It wasn't um, word learning, it wasn't communication goals, it was just that. And we told families to carry on with their usual therapies, um, but we did take some data and the wasn't a whole lot of um, access to therapy going on at the time. Um, and this is just to put the data collection for study two in context. So um, we met these children and spent a year getting to know their language skills. And then on the last um, time point of study one, um, study two began. So at that point, we gave the parents a tablet, we showed them how to use the app, and we allocated them their random um, intervention schedule and we determined which sounds should be worked on and allocated those as well. And then at four months later, at time point five, um, we came back to get the feedback on the, on the app intervention. In between those two times, there was a baseline period and an intervention period. Um, so during the baseline period, all the families had to do was do this uh, weekly test of the nine sounds. So very dry, just ask your child if they can say the sound, the sound gets uploaded, the, the uh, parent rating gets uploaded, and that's the end of it. And then when the intervention started, they carried on doing these weekly tests, but they also did the daily engagement with the app. And so in terms of feasibility, um, we had two uh, criteria. So we had a questionnaire with um, 10 questions on a kind of Likert scale. And we had a, we set the threshold for acceptability at 24 out of 40 on, the, on that um, score. And then for usability, because we were asking families to do 25 minutes of practice a week, we set the threshold for kind of adequate engagement with the, the app as 12 and a half minutes. So um, looking at the results of that feasibility side of things, um, the acceptability feedback was really good. So the scores exceeded our threshold and many families gave us the qualitative feedback as well that they really thought the app was worthwhile and uh, a good framework for working on, on sounds with their child. Um, children, especially like the mirror aspect and looking at themselves, making the sounds. We also got lots of really valuable feedback uh, about how to improve the app and things that may not have um, gone so well. Um, so that was really useful as well. One of the main things was um, parents wanted it to be easier to customize. I think um, one parent wanted it to just interface with YouTube so that they didn't have to really do very much. And then um, another thing was uh, making it more game-like and have kind of more game features. But we did this on quite a low budget. So unfortunately it was quite dry. Um, and the final bit of, I think, really important feedback was that the test module, this doing the weekly test, um, may have been slightly off-putting for some of the children. So it was their first exposure to the app, but it was actually the most boring part of the app. And so um, making that more uh, entertaining and fun, but without prejudicing the kind of need to do a, 
a cold probe of the, of the sounds um, would be a challenge for the next uh, iteration of the app. In terms of usability, it was a slightly mixed picture. So um, the group kind of split in half, half of the group um, did engage meaningfully with the app and they did the test trials and the intervention trials. Um, but if we measured how much time they spent on the intervention and only three met the uh, threshold that we set, which is obviously disappointing. And then other people um, engaged either minimally or they, or they, they dropped out of, of engaging with it at all. Um, and we got lots of interesting feedback about why, and some things were ex external, uh, so family problems, health problems. Um, some children actually, report, the families reported that they just didn't get on with technology, and that was a kind of more global thing with them. They, they didn't like screens, um, which we were surprised by. Um, but also a, a big issue with this particular trial was that there were some technological limitations. So if you think about it, we were transferring a lot of videos between um, our server and, and the, the, um, the devices and um, some, sometimes it stuck and I think um, particularly with this cohort once you make a bad impression it's really difficult to kind of keep going and persevering with, with it even if you've solved the technical problem. So, so that's the, um, the feasibility side so to, sum to summarise and circle back to my predictions um, acceptability um, was good and usability um, didn't really meet the criteria. So you may be wondering if this uh, intervention had any um, effects on speech skills in, in this group. And there's a paper coming out soon where we talk about our results, but we, we're we um, mainly trying to showcase the method that we use because I think that's really important for um, developing the evidence base. So as I've mentioned, um, single case experiments are kind of a bit lower down in the pyramid of um, evidence, um, but there's a couple of ways that you can boost that and so enhance them um, and we try to incorporate both of those in this um, in this efficacy analysis so one of them is to incorporate randomization with a randomization test and I'm going to explain what that means um, and another way another one is to make sure that you do lots and lots of replications and then pool the uh, outcomes in, using um, a between case effect size so there's been lots of innovation in terms of how you can analyze these um, the data from these um, single case experiments. Um, in the past, they were just, um, you would just look at a chart and sort of see if you saw the trend going up, but now it's it's a lot more um, innovative and complicated. So trying to incorporate some of those methods as well. Um, so this is the, um, uh, just a kind of taking people back to basics with single case design, uh, a very vanilla example of a, a single case study with a baseline period and an intervention period, which is what we had. And the idea is that you repeatedly measure the same thing over the period. And what you hope is that the introduction of the intervention is linked with an increase in the skill that you're trying to build. And so this, these are made up later, but this shows that you have a sort of flat, stable baseline, and then it goes up when you introduce the intervention, which is what, what we would want to see. And how can randomization help with our our design. Well, um, what you can do is if you know how long you have for your experiment, you can um, decide uh, within your constraints how many different uh, possible schedules of, of A and B weeks there are. So if you need at least three weeks of baseline and six weeks of intervention, these are all the different permutations of, of your schedule that are possible. And then what you do is take your data, so randomly allocate one of the schedules. And then when you take your data, you can compare the actual outcome with the distribution of possible outcomes that you would have got if you'd chosen a different schedule. Um, and it's quite hard to explain with so few permutations because it, it, it's, it's need, you need more um, data. But when you combine um, the results of different cases doing this process, you can actually see if the pattern of results that you see um, are what you would expect um, if you assume the null hypothesis that the intervention had no effect. And this generates a, a p-value. Um, anyway, these are the results of um, our trial. And um, the first thing to notice is, I suppose, the, there's a lot of variability. Um, the black line is uh, when the intervention schedule was allocated, so the, the, the allocated start. 
Um, but the dotted line is when the start actually happens. So I think it just um, goes to show that when you're trying to do things on a very precise time frame, you have to bear in mind that families sometimes, um, you know, they have a bad week or they need a, a little time to kind of mobilize. Um, so that was a, a good learning point. Um, but in terms of the statistical analysis, um, there was no treatment effect. Um, I think I'll go on to talk about possible reasons why, but I think clearly with such a short, brief intervention, um, it would be uh, unlikely to, you'd be unlikely to see a, a big change in skills, um, especially given what we know about uh, other interventions that have been tried, that have tried to um, build similar skills that have taken a really long time to make a small amount of progress. But one good thing that came out of this is that we, we discovered that parents were really good at rating their their children's speech productions. So these um, dots on the, on the graph are all um, parent ratings, um, but we also received the videos associated with those ratings and we were able to cross check um, that parents were actually um, accurately reporting what the children were doing. So um, I'm gonna try and bring all the threads together uh, now. So um, cast your minds back to study one, um, we were talking about predictors of language growth. And we had this really interesting finding that um, speech skills were predictive, but all those kind of um, social co cognitive related skills didn't, um, weren't ha didn't have an important relationship in the model. Um, there are lots of potential reasons why, and um, it's important to acknowledge power is one of them. Um, it was a smaller sample than um, the previous study. Um, but also, it could be a, a signal that for these particular children, um, speech was an additional barrier to communication and these social variables weren't protective. So um, you could be very motivated to communicate. And in, indeed, a lot of the children on the study were using alternative forms of communication, so PECs or tablets and things like that. Um, and yet, if you have an additional uh, um, motor planning um, difficulty, it's, it's not going to be possible to start producing uh, spoken language. Um, it's also important to point out that the, the cohorts weren't uh, exactly comparable. The cohort we had were older, um, and I think that may um, be the reason why um, more we, in general, we had more children with persistent um, more significant problems with spoken language in our group, we recruited them at an older age where they were still minimally verbal at an older age. Whereas if you recruit at a younger age, there may be some children in there who are just pre-verbal and they're waiting, they're just on a different timeline, but their, their spoken language is gonna uh, blossom. Um, and so I think that goes to show that we can't rely on conclusions from um, younger samples or samples that were recruited at a young age um, as being minimally verbal to generalize to, to everyone. And this uh, idea of uh, improving the measure of speech skills by incorporating re parent report and elicited sounds, um, I think that just, just goes to show that it's really important um, with this population to really try and accurately measure all the variables that we're interested in. And taken as a whole, this kind of underscores the, the importance of speech skills in, in this cohort and um, why they are kind of, war it does warrant further exploration of the idea of um, speech skills being an important in intervention target. So bringing me on to the uh, intervention trial, um, I think the positive feedback shows that the app has got some potential, um, but many, even those who reported it as being acceptable and liking the app didn't, didn't engage um, fully with the app. And so we need to get to the bottom of that. I think it's a challenge to work with families to solve those issues of customization and making it more uh, fun to use, um, as well as solving the technical issues. And I think that um, given the efficacy result, we also need to think about them using the app over a longer time period because uh, it's unlikely to require a bit longer to um, affect any change in those skills. But at the same time, we have to recognize that app-based therapy isn't for everybody. Uh, there were some children who just didn't want to go anywhere near an app and some parents just weren't able to incorporate any form of therapy into their daily lives, which, which is understandable. And finally, the, um, the efficacy piece. Uh, so yeah, I think um, it's difficult to conclude anything from the null result, but um, I think dosage uh, was uh, 
the, so dosages, how, how, how often and how much in, intervention is involved. Um, I think other studies have um, spent a long time trying to train some skills like this and have only had a, a small improvement in skills, uh, which may beg the question, well, is this a good use of anyone's energy then? But I think that um, it hasn't, we haven't really had that high quality evidence to say either way. So um, yes, it's really important to work on communication goals alongside this. Um, that's really vital to give, uh, to reduce frustration and give people a voice. Um, but I don't think we should just um, ignore uh, the role that speech may play uh, in communication. Um, and the idea that parents can rate their children's productions and upload them in this kind of fairly non-invasive way is really good because if we're trying to do other studies where we measure speech skills over time, this is a good way of doing it without having to come into people's homes and sort of do procedures. If parents can just upload it, that would be really helpful. Um, and then finally, I just want to, sort of, I know some uh, practitioners are, are in the audience, so I just think that, um, it's really worth thinking about whether this kind of design incorporating randomization and replication um, could be used more to try and um, boost the evidence base, make, um, make us more aware of what works for whom, and um, perhaps take a, a more collective approach where we pool data with each other. So my take home messages um, are that speech skills are important. Uh, they might be a barrier to oral language for some, um, and changing them is really hard. Um, and I think working with families to try and create a really usable, fun app that can be used over a longer time period um, is, is essential, whilst not forgetting about alternative methods of communication. So I'd just like to thank um, everyone who helped me on my project, uh, my fabulous supervisor and co-author Courtney Norbury, and uh, all the families who um, took time to take part in the study. And thanks for listening.